Hello, beautiful visionaries of Entheo Nation. This is Lorna Liana, your host. And in today's segment, we're going to talk about the healing power of Icaros. I'm here with Susana Bustos, PhD, who is a psychotherapist, professor, and an independent researcher of indigenous and entheogenic shamanic traditions of the Americas. Her main interests revolve around the interface between Western psychotherapy and traditional medicine, the healing potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness, and the integration of those states into daily life. Uh, Susanna lectures and works as a consultant um, internationally, and she also holds a private practice in Berkeley, California. So welcome to the show, Susanna. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Lorna. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to be here today. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your a story of how you ended up being a researcher of um, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness and indigenous and entheogenic shamanic traditions. Because I know you've spent a lot of time in Peru. I remember um, when you were um, as, as studying with uh, Juan Flores Salazar in Mayan Tuyaku, and I'm sure you've learned so much from that time and more. So uh, help uh, help us get up to speed in terms of you know what your journey has been. Okay. Well, this is this is a very long answer, so I'm going to try to make it short because if I start, I won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifelong journey. <laughs> well, um, if like my my interest on on non and the, on the healing potential of non ordinary states of consciousness started, you know. Uh, maybe, I don't know, like 25 years ago and even uh, more. Um, and uh, one of the key components of this uh, uh, journey was my training with Stan Groff in uh, hot tropic breathwork and transpersonal psychology in Argentina many years mm. ago, about uh, 18 years ago. And uh, through that uh, training, I got to know a few people who were doing at that time work in in Peru with some vegetalistas, some uh, curanderos healers that were using uh, uh, ayahuasca, this psychotropic medicine, but also other plants for healing purposes. And I said, well, I don't know anything about this. Uh, I would like to get to know what this is. This is part of my roots, you know, as a Latin American person, and I need to know. So um, these people came to Chile, where I was living at that time, and they did a ceremony, and they conducted a ceremony that was extremely uh, long, and uh, it cracked my heart and my mind open. Um, to a degree that it had consequences in, in my life r right away. Like three days later, I had uh, um, kind of a, a, a whole pattern of Kundalini rising with um, major seizures that were coming from my spine mm. all the way up and openings of consciousness. And that was lasting uh, too long and it was too frequent during the day. And since I had all this training, um, I, I could kind of link what happened um, in the ceremony with what was happening in my body energetically and also at the mental state. So um, after pursuing uh, uh, healing work uh, of different sorts, including holotropic breath work and body work and energetic work for uh, months, um, I decided that I needed to uh, hold it differently because things were like stopped at some point and I had a very big blockage at the heart level at that time and I couldn't just like overcome it so um, I was working at that time uh, in Chile with uh, drug abuse prevention programs nationally and um, had heard about Takiwasi which is this drug abuse rehabilitation uh, program in uh, Peru, in the area of Tarapoto, Provincia de San Martín, and I said, well, I need to go somewhere where they know how to handle this situation, because I just don't know what else to do. 
And um, so I went there because of this condition, you know, that opened up very strongly for me. And uh, and um, I worked there with uh, this amazing curandero called uh, Don Solante Lozano, who was there at the time, and he uh, really helped me through kind of realigning energetically certain things and opening up. And he worked a lot with Icaros on me, uh, not with medicine. He just worked with Icaros and prayers and fanning and blowing smoke uh, on different um, energetic um, chakras. And, um, and then th there was uh, the need to do ceremony too. And he was not present because of different reasons. But I worked there with uh, people at Takiwasi who were holding ceremony. And I had uh, not been able to talk to them about what was happening with me, only with Don Solon, um, for different reasons, you know. Uh, and I went to that ceremony really scared. Uh, really scared. And I remember that um, at some point of the ceremony, uh, one of the leaders who was a woman called me forward and she sang an Icaro on me. That was an Icaro uh, that's called Abre de Corazón that's now very known, uh, like, you know, in, in the circles, like people sing it in different ways as well, you know, but she's the one who received that Icaro actually. And um, it just was, it really, really exploded, you know, that blockage that I had in um, in hearing and receiving at that deep level, you know, the words and the meaning in the way that I needed in order to remove that blockage. And um, it was pivotal in my healing process, though it, you know, required more work and years actually to complete that process that opened up with that trigger, you know, back in Chile. Um, so since since that experience, I started going to the jungle like every year to do my own work and also to start kind of seeing how these medicines were applied and used, you know, in with incredible results also uh, for drug abuse rehabilitation and also seeing the challenges because it's not just that easy, you know, it involves a whole system to support, you know, the, the process of uh, addiction treatment, you know, it's not just the medicine, it's much larger and support required, but in all this, um, different methods and practices, the Icaro was always present. And I, um, I, um, I kept this, uh, also said being a music therapist myself, like, what's the power, what's, what's in here in these songs that has this healing potential, along with many other you know, other potentials, like the Icaros are used for many different purposes, including sorcery, right? But when used in a context of healing, how is it that they just can cut through things and get you standing up back on yourself, right? So, so yeah, so uh, just to really quickly, what exactly are Icaros? If you could just kind of help um, the audience understand, uh, those of you who don't really know what that term means. Mm -hmm. So Icaro is uh, it's basically the, the shamanic song that is um, sung within the vegetalismo tradition. But, you know, right now, because of the expansion of ayahuasca or over to uh, there you know, Icaros used as a generic term to refer to those songs that are sung during ayahuasca ceremonies. So um, there are many speculations about where Icaro comes from in terms of a word. You know, it's uh, speculations like uh, Icaro means, uh, comes from the, the uh, verb Icaray, which means to blow smoke in order to heal. That is a, a speculation that Luis Eduardo Luna, an anthropologist, made many years ago. And uh, now there are other um, ideas, but there are also some words that come from different traditions that have also that little mood of Ica or Icar, right? That has to do with like opening paths um, 
clearing out obstacles, opening, giving light to, you know, a straight line, straightening things um, in different indigenous languages. Right? Um, uh, I, we don't know etymologically, you know, exactly where it comes from, but it has that connotation. And it's uh, the shamanic song that is used not only in ayahuasca ceremonies within the vegetalismo tradition but also in other uh, endeavors that are shamanic interesting so um so basically then um yeah it was my understanding of ikaros were the shamanic songs that are sung during ayahuasca ceremonies but you're saying that actually those songs um have a much wider range of uses yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's correct for example um you alluded to sorcery. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So yeah. so how how would one encounter those ikaros? Like, can you give me some examples that would show us that a wide range? Well, ikaros traditionally were used for, for example, you want to uh, you 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 you're gonna go to fish, right, and get fish. So you you would sing. A song, and this is uh, maybe the core of the Icaro itself, which is like the Icaro uh, is uh, the musical manifestation of of the essence, the spirit essence, or the spiritual essence of a natural element um, that may be uh, animal or mineral or plant related or has to do with a particular strength uh intelligence and force even structure that is associated with a natural element so you shamanically we when, when we talk about shamanic oriented traditions we are talking about uh a person who acts like a bridge and has been able to connect to this plane and open up uh, the communication with these uh, um, unseen forces that are part of nature that are supporting our lives in this network web of life that we live in, right? So they have this contact and one of the ways of calling in those uh, knowledges and powers is by singing the song that will call that into something. So when we say like Icarar, something, a substance or a person or an object, you know, it's like the infusion of that power into that object or that person. So the power comes with a knowledge and comes with a structure at the same time, but it has to do with the intimacy of relationship that the healer or the curandero or the shaman or the brujo has of, uh, with that natural power. Interesting. So, is it just the shamans that sing Icaros, or you know, is it really so much a um, a part of the you know cultural life and traditions of a you know indigenous community, for example? Well, th this is the distinction of what do you call an Icaro. Mm -hmm. So we are calling Icaros now generically to many things, right? Um, Traditionally, the Icaro, traditionally, in this tradition particularly, the Icaro is used by the shaman. And, um, and also, um, you know, all of us, and particularly in mestizo uh, traditions, can uh, commune with certain natural forces to the point of where we can uh, also have a song or get a song that would uh, bring that in. So what I'm saying basically is that we are all able, you know that, right, to get access to this uh, other forces. The thing is that we have in, the sh in, the, in the shaman we have a specialist in this who has just devoted his life to making these connections. 
Yeah, it's interesting because one of the things that I noticed as a visitor in uh, to the Amazon, especially, you know, the different countries that I've um, been to where I've had the uh, opportunity to spend time with indigenous healers and shamans, it almost seems like um, the trend is or the, the belief is that the more songs the shaman has, the more powerful they are. And so I see this in Brazil where, you know, uh, some of the sh um, the shamans that I know just have hundreds and hundreds of songs and, you know, people are in awe of like all the songs that they continue to receive and, uh, n you know, very like, yeah, I mean, it's a process to record them. It's another process to even write them down, but they're just, you know, overflowing with songs. Is that the case too in the Peruvian side? Um, are the powerful shamans the ones that are typically have the most songs? Well, uh, yes. Basically, the amount of songs that you have is um, is considered one of the uh, one of the you know resources of power that the shaman has. And but also traditionally, like those th those songs, those Icaros that are received in tongues or in languages that are not. Spanish or not understandable are also considered the, the most powerful because uh, it um, you know there is this belief and this kind of practical belief basically that, that the spirits of nature communicate with words and with sounds that are not uh, human like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that the ayahuasca music I've listened to has certain patterns and, you know, and qualities of sound that are very different than, for example, peyote songs. Yes. And I've noticed that the, there are similarities in the kind of tonalities and the sounds that come through the ayahuasca songs I've seen in, you know, the different countries. Right. Which is, which is fascinating, too. So... Yeah. Um, yeah. And this, and this is also changing, you know, there there are the exposure that people working down there ha have right now to other types of music, especially because of, you know, uh, globalization and also this interest of Westerners of going down, you know, and also bringing their own songs into, for example, ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, has, has been also changing, like the traditional patterns that we could see kind of on a, on a more consistent basis 20 or 30 years ago. So I've seen, for example, in my maestro, I've seen in, I, in other maestros, I'm just thinking of, about somebody who just passed away, also an old curandero, you know, uh, how their own Icaros are like incorporating melodies and structures that are a little bit different than what I remember and I even have recorded, you know, years ago. Yeah, one of the phenomena that I've been noticing in Brazil is, well, there's this uh, renaissance of um, indigenous culture that has been really sparked by the interest of Westerners in, you know, ayahuasca. So there's a lot more movement that is, um, you know, happening in, in like the, the region. So for example, I spent the most amount of time in the state of Acre. And in many of these villages, they're very, very hard to get to. It's like days, you know, and days of, of travel on these rivers. And, you know, these villages are receiving more visitors than they ever have before. And then also some of the, um, the uh, indigenous leaders are getting to travel around Brazil to lead ceremonies and also internationally. So the um, uh, the intercultural um, uh, connections are really, uh, you know, adding a very interesting um, evolution to uh, the the traditional, um, you know, indigenous culture in that uh, it's so, so it's interesting, like um, uh, one of the shamans who I worked with to create an album um, of his music. The album is called um, um, Transformando Tradição, 
which is transforming tradition. And so we're seeing this evolution of tradition into kind of like, you know, more modern flavors. So for example, um, one thing that we're seeing with the tribes is that, you know, with the advent of the guitar, um, a lot of the shamans are taking their old ancestral songs and then mm. adding guitar chords to right. the the words, and then it just becomes a totally different song that everyone can sing to. And like the Brazilians from outside the region just love it, and they're you know these songs are even kind of like making their way around the major cities of Brazil and mm. uh, and internationally. So I have this one song that I recorded on YouTube that has seventy thousand YouTube views already, wow. and it's got to be mostly people trying to learn how to actually sing the song itself too so so that's an interesting phenomenon on one hand and then you know in just greater brazil we're also seeing um the different you know ayahuasca churches um and evolution of the the music that the churches um uh create or, or produce and so you know we've got like the santo daime church and some very judeo-christian type of hymns that are sung, you know, in the churches. But then, you know, we've got these other, you know, groups that are incorporating, you know, Hindu music, African music. Right. Yeah, and it works really well, actually. <laughs> it's right. beautiful. It's beautiful. Right, right. So um, that is obviously, you know, a phenomenon I, I have seen happening in, in Peru, you know, in the past. Especially in the past, like 10, 12 years, with uh, all these um, Westerners going down there, there are centers that are using uh, Hindu music, you know, and Buddhist practices, you know, with ayahuasca, and they incorporate also Buddhist uh, mantras, you know, as songs during the ceremonies. And, um, you know, there is a very known uh, ayahuasquero also in the area of Tarapoto who is an accomplished musician and he uses like a lot of Andean instruments, you know, um, kenas and samponas, you know, this like uh, um, wind music, music instruments in his ceremonies and charangos and, and other things, right? And it's just uh, very powerful for people who are uh, in ceremony to see and hear all these subtleties and the connection that that brings from you know other realms as well um i would want to just bring up uh, this theory by martin dopkin the reels you know and and uh, cats like that was maybe thought of like in the 70s i don't remember exactly but it's a very brief article where she says that um in their understanding the icaros work as a jungle gym um for for children, right? Just like trying to make an analogy, in that it provides with culturally shaped patterns that the mind in in, in the the organism, right, under the influence of ayahuasca, for example, offers to the person who's who's listening, so that you can just like. Um, kind of climb the patterns, climb the ways that are necessary for your healing or for your whatever you're working through at that moment, you know, by by holding these possibilities, right? But they emphasize that the Icaros are culturally shaped pathways, basically, that you can like hold on to. And, um, and that would, if, if we follow that understanding, right, we would say, well, um, 30 years ago, there was not much, much, much exposure, maybe as it is right now, you know, to all this like worldwide music possibilities as it is right now. So the culture itself is changing and, and, it, and it has been. I always say, you know, shamanism has survived like the amount of millennia that it has just because of its ability to incorporate new things instead of getting break, broken down, right? It's core because it's too rigid, right? It's very flexible in that way. It incorporates every time new material and it makes it its own, right? Um, so um, maybe it's expanding. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I won't, you know, I tend to have a more traditional kind of... Uh, 
engagement with with this um, in my vision, but I'm totally um, kind of in awe with what's happening also around and uh, observing, you know, where are these practices going to evolve? Um, so just observing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating <laughs> observation. I'm really enjoying it myself. So um, I'm curious to know, uh, based on your research, uh, what is the function uh, what are the function of ikaros in ayahuasca rituals mm -hmm. so I, I noticed that's a really quite an art when a, a shaman you know brings in the ikaros into the work it almost seems like it's timed in a certain way or the shaman is like very in tune with the energy of the space and then what songs need to come into place and of course you know for me not understanding the words and or their meaning uh, it seems very magical but i don't know what the purpose is or what they mean so what do you know about their function Mm -hmm. In ayahuasca ceremonies, basically the the the, the ayahuasquero is calling um, through the, the first ikaros those forces that would give a safe container for the ceremony to happen. So he's setting the pillars of the ceremony. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the relationship that he has with certain forces over others you know, are, are related to his own uh, allies to just like provide that container. So normally in a ceremony, the first Icaros are just uh, those that are, provide the, the context and the structure at the spiritual level to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Then then there are some uh, Icaros that are called para levantar mariación and mm -hmm. y para bajar mariación. So that that are those are the ikaros that help raise the state of um, the visionary state and the people that are there, right? So uh, you probably have seen like how certain melodies and, and tonalities and rhythms to like tend to just like put you up up there, right? And then. Um, it's very important also for the person leading to know how to regulate uh, the the ascent with the descent, right? So you, you don't want uh, it to get out of control in that way. You want to provide um, a space for healing and for, for teachings to happen for people within a contained framework, and they are managing that through the Icaros as well. There are also some Icaros that are for our protection. Uh, and normally what we call the arcana ikaros, you know, are used to, uh, traditionally, arcana ikaros are those that uh, you, the, the, the shaman may sing during ayahuasca ceremonies to culminate a planned diet process of somebody who is part of the ceremony and install a defense in that body. That's fascinating. So that's, um, yeah, yeah. So energetically, um, it's also a gift of the shaman to just install a defense in your body so that you can deal with, you know, like all this opening that happens at all these many layers, not only psychologically, emotionally, but also spiritually and energetically. It's also, it has its risks. So you need to, um, in this path, develop some tools, and some of the tools are given, right, are given after some work. So this is also the, the way that I've learned uh, what an arcana is. So it's not just that, you know, arcanas normally in my uh, experience and years of work are not um, just sunk for everybody, you know. There are some also defensive kind of um, Icaros that are used, but they are not called arcana in the ceremony, as far as I have studied yet. But you can also use the Icaro for defense in ceremony. You can also use the Icaros for healing purposes in the ceremony. Uh, there are certain Icaros that um, are, uh, some people say that they are for vomiting. 
I think so too. I was going to mention it. I'm I'm pretty sure I've experienced some of those ikaros where I'm listening to the shaman and I feel like the words of the ikaro are making their way through my body deep into my intestines, and then before you know it, like I, there's this uh, you know incontrollable urge to go vomit, <laughs> and then everyone starts vomiting, right? <laughs> Well, I would I would say that you know part of the healing process sometimes requires the purging at different levels, like from the physical level that is connected to it, the energetic level that it's connected to emotional level that is you know it's like it's uh, so for me those are still healing ikaros, you know mm -hmm. it's kind of a subcategory of um, of the healing ikaros and it's part of the process of healing and then. When you get that to that point, there are also the ikaros that are called um, the warmi ikaros, and the warmi ikaros are used within ayahuasca ceremonies, but also outside. Kind of, you know, traditionally is set to to gain the love of a woman, but they are also uh, so you can do things like tying up a woman or a man, you know, to your own energetic structure. You know, those are like kind of uh, sophisticated uh, magical sorcery kind of uh, things that happen down there. They are real, right? basically um, real practices, you know, down there. Down there. Still, um, but the one Mikaros are also used during ayahuasca ceremonies to uh, enlighten this, the, the mood, the energy that is kind of hitting heavy in a ceremony. So you would bring in um, songs of certain birds. You would bring uh, songs that have kind of an edge of humor to uh, enlighten the spirit and the mood of the people doing hard work there. And then there are closing ikaros too, where you just um, not everybody does this in the same way, you know, when we are in shamanistic traditions, we are like, we have certain things that are core things that everybody does, and then there is a lot of variability depending on the shaman or the ayahuasquero himself, right? But there are certain uh, ones that are very clear about like doing closing ikaros and dismissing then those forces that were there present doing the dance through the, uh, the participants, you know, and doing the work. You just dismiss them and give them thanks, and then you close the ceremony. So th those are the main functions that come to me right now out of, out of, off the top of my head, mind, you know, to share with you. Wow, that seems so different from the Brazilian side of the Amazon where, you know, I kind of call it the Brazilian sing-along. Uh, because over on the uh, side, you know, other side towards, you know, of, of the Andes, we're, we're looking at, you know, the, you know, largely just the, the shaman and possibly his attendants, you know, that are really leading um, with the songs and controlling the energy through their Icaros. But in Brazil, everybody sings together. So there may be one person that is, you know, the, the leader that is, you um, choosing which song that's sung but it's such a you know group process where you've got your book and everyone's encouraged to sing along and then it's like this a group prayer so to speak so um uh yeah it isn't so specific like that so that that's really fascinating um, yeah, it's very different, and I think it's you know that's the diversity that we have also you know in the in this entheogenic world you know working with ayahuasca you, when you see like the Tucano people for example of Colombia right like they also have you know indigenous indigenous traditional you know ways are like okay all the men are just there dancing and then pounding their their sticks on the floor and they are singing together, you know, and they are just expressing themselves, you know. And here in the Hitaismo, you're supposed not to express yourself. You have, you're supposed to just like sit straight, you know, and, uh, and work inside. So that is, you know, the value of what um, also in, in the UDV, for example, you know, the Union de Vegetal is called the concentration state. Mm -hmm. So it's the value of, um, of being in, in such in such a state of uh, uh, focus 
on the work that you are just like uh, uh, channeling, working, digesting, metabolizing whatever you need inside yourself, and not externalizing it, right? Mm-hmm. It's like so, a meditation. It's a deep yeah. meditation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a deep mm-hmm. meditation. So it's not valued this self-expression as it is in other cultures that you know with their own legitimacies and their own healing uh consequences you know that way so i'm curious to know um about uh, how ikaros are learned and received and this has been a bit of a um uh, so I've been so intrigued by this, um, and I've uh, you know had a, a number of conversations with people who have received songs. Um, in on the Brazilian side, they refer to it as receiving songs from the astral, receiving songs from the spirit world, and they come to people in uh, a number of different ways. Sometimes, um, you know, I, what, I spoke to this one you know musician who has many many songs, and he'll describe it as well. Sometimes he'll, he'll get the entire song. Um, um, the words and the melody all at once or sometimes like you know over a period of a few weeks he'll you know start to hear the melody and he'll work it out musically on his guitar and then the words come but what I find really fascinating is that you know in uh, you know in the uh, cult the ayahuasca culture of Brazil um, people have a uh, practice or a culture um, uh, well, go- gosh, uh, there, there's a phenomena, that's probably a better word, a phenomena of receiving songs that are part of a set. So, and that whole set of songs will be part of a inario or a hymnal, where it's like a series of songs that seem to have a similar uh, theme uh, or message, uh, as well as melody. And then people that have received many inarios, like there's some uh, padrinos and madrinas of the Santo Daime Church that have books and books of, of hymnals and, and their songs, um, they will say that, you know, they, they know when the last song is of that inarios is complete. And then it's time for a new one. Um, so, and, and sometimes I've, I've spoken to people that just have received these songs spontaneously. So one man whose songs I recorded um, was telling me that they, he was in the middle of a work and um, the Padrino made this announcement of, you know, allowing the celestial music to come, you know, through, you know, come through your body. And then as soon as he was done with that speech and there was a pause, um, my friend Tiago opened his mouth and this song came out like he had never ever sung it before like melody word being totally complete and he just sang in that space so i'm curious to know on the peruvian side or you know uh what have you seen with regards to learning and receiving songs and can anyone sing icaros of of course anybody can sing icaros you know the thing is what's the effect that Mm -hmm. your song is gonna have and that um, again in that tradition it has to do and I, I always stress that and that's my understanding right at the level of intimacy that you have been able to develop with that force that you that you um, are using right there are times where forces in ceremonies just use you mm-hmm you know and uh, I also have experienced myself like this being taken by a song and I just like have to sing and I am singing something totally like impossible to stop that is totally taking me and I don't have any choice it's just like I I am taken by something that is like much larger than myself in that moment and then forget it i i haven't been able to remember that later um that ikaro later right um it's just the power of the presence full presence of being taken and just like singing it through um there you know i have uh, heard many descriptions uh of uh, people who lead ceremonies to uh in peru with that that type of characteristic so you you're taken you're you have to sing that and then you just lose it and it might come in another ceremony again or not right um the main the main point in vegetalismo in in the way that it was traditionally and it's still going but again there are a lot of changes is that 
in order for you to commune with the power of something, you have to ingest it in your body. There is a process of ingest, ingestion and um, um, kind of uh, accommodation of that power within you. So in order for you to be able to manage it effectively afterwards, right? As a, as a ayahuasquero, like you, many of us can do plant diets, for example, and we are doing that in one way or another, but it's very different to be like in a training, to become an ayahuasquero, for example, or a curandero, than to be receiving healing um, only and being a patient, you know, in recovery of something, for example. But um, uh, the reason I'm saying this is that the main... Uh, way in this mestizo tradition to receive Icaros is through the process of plant dieting or mineral dieting or whatever else you're just ingesting in your body. So um, this process of plant dieting means that in the process of apprenticing you go to a tambo, a small structure in the middle of the jungle in isolation and you consume, you're, you're isolated, you're restricted of um, food, you know, you just eat very, very simple, normally plantain and rice and that's it, and you drink water and you drink uh, a, a brew of the plant or the plants that you're communing with. Uh, depending on the strength of the plant once, twice, or three times per day. Sometimes you have to skip a day. It depends on the strength of the plant and how it works in the organism. Um, and what happens during the plant process is that there is like a micro depuration of toxins that are not only in the body. You tend to like sweat a lot. You're eating without salt and stuff. And uh, you, you tend to sweat a lot, and, um, and there is a lot of dreams that come also as a way of like kind of uh, emptying yourself out of the normal chatteries and stuff, and emotionally too, just like feel how the body after a few days starts like kind of uh, opening and relaxing to new states of uh, well being. Um, depends on what you're dieting, the process varies, right? But this is basically like a structure of the process to a point where I, what that I call being transparent, becoming transparent to, to the environment. You basically start being part of the jungle. Um, when the traditional curanderos say that when the process of diet Thing is a successful one in your process of apprenticeship, then the plant will grant you a nicaro, which is that the plant is going to tell you you have done a good job and this is the way that you can call me back to use me, to bring me to you. And uh, descriptions of how people receive these Icaros during diet processes processes are like many, but a few of them. Well, I was lying on my hammock, right, on my eighth day of dying, and I was just hearing something, you know, as if there was somebody in the back, a very tiny voice in the back of my head, but I could barely move, so I couldn't really see it, you know, and it was singing something, and it made me sing that thing until I, and repeated and repeated until I got the words and I got the melody. Normally they get first the melody, this is in the reports that I have been able to gather, and then later, first the melody, then the words start come, kind of coming in, and then Old Curandero says, the genie of the plant, so the genie of the plant is tiny, and he's the one who is singing that and repeats until I get it. And there is a, a, a very interesting thing with, that happens, which is like, an, I have seen that many times, which is like an obsessive quality of that song. So you, you're like, 
you cannot get that song out of your mind until you learn it, right? It's, and it also during plant diet processes, you know, um, where you are already in what I call like a dreamlike state. So you're not in a, your normal consciousness, even if these plants are not entheogenic in nature, right? They provoke a state of mariación of their own that is not psychotropic, but it's different. And it's a combination of everything, of being in the jungle, in isolation. You know, there is a, uh, like a sense deprivation happening on one hand, and, um, and on the other hand, you are like overloaded with stimuli. Yeah. There is a combination of things that kind of make you enter into this state. Um, but also in the, the dream world, when you are really dreaming at night, you enter into a type of dream world that it's very intense, very vivid normally. That um, sometimes you have sequences and sequences of dreams, right, that you forget. And there are some others that are just like being here. Right, so you may also receive songs during the dream state, not just there. Sometimes uh, I also have heard and experienced myself um, uh, that it is nature in that dreamlike state during daytime or at nighttime because you start also sleeping very little that is singing, it's like a choir of. A melody and song that is uh, singing through nature. It's nature singing, you know, and you can hear it outside of yourself coming from everywhere. Right? That's um, that's the way that uh, that has been mostly praised by traditional curanderos, because you have installed the plant itself, the brew inside your body. You have accomplished a strenuous work, which is, you know, to be uh, in, in isolation from your own, from, from your family. You know, you, you're, ju ju you're just not indulging in anything in that context. You're just like really in a disciplined uh, situation. You need to be disciplined, actually, you know, and at the same time, you just surrender to the process there. Um, so, uh, so there is an intimacy that it starts happening where the plant is working you and you're like getting to know her. And as I say, the crowning of that, the, 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 uh, the premio, the prize, you know, it's like saying, okay, this is it. You can call me this way. Okay. Um, there are also evidently like Icaros that come in ceremonies. So I have um, also some, some, um, stories to tell about like how do they come in ceremonies and they may come also for other people now i have also like some reports of people telling that they have received this ikaro in ceremony not for them to use but to give to the ayahuasquero that was the instruction interesting right <laughs> wow right. and also uh you know the the, the Icaros are not only received in this way, they are also transmitted from, apprent from, from mentor to apprentice. Mm -hmm. they, um, there is also a lineage in the Provincia de San Martín that is disappearing. I haven't seen it like in the last 15 years anymore, but it was reported to me of installation of the Icaros um, of, from the mentor to the apprentice through the singing of the Icaro it's a procedure where you install the Icaro energetically inside the body of the, of the apprentice and that process may last up to three weeks right? it's not just like a one time thing uh, it might last uh, much longer and that is similar if we compare that to the installation of Arcana so when, when I'm talking about uh, the body and the ingestion, I'm talking about your body. In, in this tradition, your body is pivotal, it's just key in, um, in holding the Icaro, holding the um, 
and developing the cauldron of your relationship so that you can use it effectively. So there are, that's why also it's important that I bring up this, um, there are some curanderos who say that it's not about the reception of Icaros that much. It's about the correct resonance of the voice. What is the effectiveness that your Icaro has in a particular situation? And the resonance of the voice is built through plant diet. So um, the healing properties and the healing or whatever other use you know you use for the Icaros you you you, you have for the Icaros has to do with that kind of resonance that makes the uh, the healing the whatever this the the spirit the force to slip into the object the person the situation that you're trying to influence that is so fascinating wow um uh, gosh, I would love to one day have this opportunity and the space and time to be able to uh, do some plant dietas and experience that. Um, I'm curious to know in the Vitalismo tradition, um, are these songs mainly for the recipient or can they be shared? So, for example, what I see in Brazil is if one person receives a song, sometimes, you know, their their friends or their community will get together and everyone will learn that person's, that song and sing it together. And then if they've got an inario, then on the person's birthday, everyone gets together and sings that person's inario on their birthday in a work. So in, um, in Vegetalismo, um, are these songs your personal songs of power or, or can you share them with your community it's uh it's very different I mean, we're we're talking here about it this is not a community-based uh tradition mm -hmm. um so we're talking about a mestizo tradition mm -hmm. that evolved from from indigenous knowledge and it's mixed with christian elements and with other influences that uh over time so it's mixed race in that way um and you know curanderos that were do performing all these things you know in the past and still today you know are, are t tend to be like in the outskirts of the cities in the jungle you know and they have their own chakra there they're kind of removed from an, a real insertion in the, in the community except for some of them that are like in settlements still like working you know in in the jungle or in larger like for example in uh, thinking of um Chasuta, right? Like there's an old curandero there living and working for 60, 70 years. He's still alive, right? He's part of the community in that way. But it's, uh, think of this as not a community based kind mm -hmm. of, you know, this is a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, so these songs are your own songs to be used for a particular intention and they're your your personal songs of of uh, power essentially exactly and there are you know a lot of stories too of like the curanderos protecting the songs mm -hmm. and even like when you're in ceremony like not articulating well the songs they're just like singing the songs but kind of like right in a way that it's not easy to understand because of fear of being robbed and stolen wow <laughs> really can you steal someone else's song and would it work so well there are stories of like you know how uh, some like traveled long distances to go to a powerful healer to just steal a song that was a powerful song you know and being able to use it afterwards yourself right I don't know I have heard many of these things. I haven't um, talked directly with somebody who has had that, you know, of like going and stealing a song or, you know. And I think things have been evolving as well. But there is a, um, you know, it's the seal of shamanic power, the type of like some core songs. And, and the ayahuasquero and the curandero may share that with people may encourage now, nowadays it's much more encouraged to, to say, okay, learn these songs, you know, 
and you're learning. It's okay, right? Um, than it was before when, you know, I'm talking about 30 years ago. Yeah. Mm. So what are some of the uh, effects of these Ikaros on the mind and body? Mm -hmm. um, plenty. And it depends, uh, depends on how ready also the person is to go and do some certain work. Um, my, my dissertation focused on um, intense healing experiences uh, uh, associated to Icaros in an ayahuasca ceremony. So where the person really attributed the healing to a particular Icaro and the way that the person engaged with that Icaro at that particular time of their healing process, process within the ceremony. So by this, I mean that, for example, there, there was somebody that uh, was part of my study that had been going to ceremonies for like two months and listening to the same Icaros. Right? And the Icaro never had the effect that it had, but that night where he, f he felt that the Icaro entered and worked in a particular way that totally uh, gave another, a new direction and a new turn to their healing process, right? So I cannot tell you generically because this is situational. It depends on the context, on the process, etc., of the person and the relationship of trust uh, with the curandero, the, the degree of like drinking plants also, you know, but um, there are, the, it ranges from the most the, the most powerful Icaros are those Icaros that engage your mind body um, unity into an experience of unity of consciousness. So you're basically feeling at the core level that that song and you are one and you are being moved with the movement that the Icaro naturally has at the core level. And you can, you, your sense of who you are, your sense of, you know, I'm Susana doing this thing, or I'm Lorna, or like gets out of the way. You're just locked into the experience of unity between the Icaro and your ident your, yourself. And that is experienced not only mentally, emotionally, it's also experienced at the physical level. You're just totally one with it and moving as it's happening. And the, the, the visionary component at that time uh, tends to be very symbolical. You just don't have um, kind of personal thoughts or connections or insights. It's just symbolical in nature and you feel that as if you feel as if the Icaro is restructuring is um, kind of doing something in your body that you feel touched by the sounds you feel moved and removed and uh, open and you know it depends on the person and what the person is is working on normally when the, the the locking phase kind of gets unlocked finally is when the person starts again recovering back the sense of individualhood um, and slowly uh, more personal uh, insights and stuff start coming back to awareness until you just like get out to the other side huh? it, this is a process and it has also you know certain things that configurate the full experience that happened before to this moment that is just culmination and then what unfolds at least in the people that I have um, studied you know it's very similar at this structural level of the process and how it unfolds and so this is for someone singing the Ikaro or for, some, or for someone listening to it listening to it mm, interesting Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm talking about like healing experiences mm -hmm. of people participating in ceremonies and attributing their healing process to an Icaro. 
mm-hmm. that they are listening within the ceremony. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, wow. I, I I know that we can talk about. I know because it's uh it's very subtle. It's very uh and it's complex in that way. It's not easy to be able to express, you know, the complexity of how all these factors are put together to generate this experience. But basically what I can tell you is that the Ikaro, when it's working, it it just like gets to a level of um, touching, you know, some people talk about like the cellular level, like the restructuring of the cell self in some way restructuring of the cells of the self mm-hmm. self so it's it's felt experienced very physically at that level but very fundamentally physically through all the other stages of yourself mm, wow that's that's very complex and very subtle and uh, um, and I understand the difficulty of describing this, having been in ceremony and experiencing the music as a, a participant and also in my limited experience uh, singing as well, which has its own, you know, phenomena. Um, I found that, you know, you can't, it's really hard to use your ego to uh, sing ayahuasca songs in a ceremony. It's, it's like the song lets itself known to you as to when it wants to be sung um it's you know the it's hard you can't just choose the song because it it doesn't fit the energy of the moment it may it's not the right song so the right song has a tendency to come through when it's supposed to come through and some of these songs really can have a lot of power so that just to sing the song and to carry that song will take a lot of your energy and once you're done with it it's like you, you know it was a intense experience to hold that song and then once it was sung it will not be sung again to uh, through the course of that night so, so that's uh yeah that's ideally right like uh, the, you know in the vigilismo tradition the the, the ayahuasqueros tend to say you know it's not me who choose what song has to be sung mm-hmm. right it's just i get different cues you know that tell me this is this is what you have to sing because it's not me who is directing the healing that's happening. You know, it's the these forces that are wanting to do it. You know, and I'm just like orchestrating, but I'm not directing. You know, um, uh, that's ideally. And then there are also like you know, especially with the you know coming this all whole change that is happening in the traditions. You know, like everybody wants to sing in ceremony. Like what a wonder to be able to sing, right? And then bring your own songs that you learn here and there. And then, you know, I have, um, you know, Robert and I like bring uh, groups to the Amazon like once per year, you know, and, um, it, you know, I have heard so many times like uh, people that we brought, bring down there, like how painful it could be to be hearing as a Nicaro that it's not matching the energy. That is mm-hmm, open, mm-hmm. right for your inner experience as mm-hmm. well so that's also you know like um developed through sensitivity and uh in participating long enough to just like restrain your own impulses to just like express yourself right uh-huh. um, and listen deeper i think that that listening is uh key in this world Mm -hmm. yeah i know in uh, brazil i often see that they reserve the um community you know sharing of songs till the very end of the ceremony so after like most of the you know the medicine has kind of abated the energy of the evening is abated and it tends to be a lot easier you know kind of like on the overall vibe and uh, and more open. And yeah, I can understand too. Sometimes there are some people that are beautiful musicians and amazing singers and others that are not. <laughs> and that becomes and even if you're a, amazing, a bit difficult. beautiful musician mm-hmm. and singer uh-huh. and you sing uh, 
something that is not like in sync mm -hmm. when what is happening there it might be um creating like this friction mm -hmm. in, in the inner experience of the other of the people interesting yeah. Wow. So this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all your really deep insight into this, you know, fascinating world that so few people know about. Uh, I'd love to leave you with the last question. Um, have you received your own um, ayahuasca ikoros? I uh, have received ikoros. Uh huh. You have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, through plant dietas, um, primarily, or in the you know ayahuasca during the course of the ayahuasca work, both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what have those songs done for you in terms of your um, awakening or conscious evolution? Wow! What a question. I think that the most yeah just what comes to me is like i uh i just feel so humbled you know like when when you in 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 this work you know and you really acknowledge that there is an otherness that are you know we're in this network in this web of life you know, where there are sentiences that are there, you know, um, available in sustaining, you know, the your path, I don't know, in the path of all of us, you know, I think that I just, I just humble myself more. It's kind of like I am in awe um, and kind of uh rep reposition my self importance <laughs> you know uh in yeah in the in the acknowledgement of uh the intelligences that surround us that uh love us that support us that are there that's the main thing that comes to me when you ask that question Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. How can we best stay in touch with you, Susanna? Oh, um, you could go to our website uh, with Robert Tyndall. That's called roamingthemind.com. And my contact info is there. And hopefully soon I will also, I'm working on a website that, that also uh, shares what I offer in terms of private practice and, and work. So that would be susanabustos.com, but it's to come. All right. Thank you so much, and you have a beautiful day. Thank you, Lorna. Bye-bye. Thank you for all this time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>